There we go. Apparently, I am back. So, anyways, I get to the dentist. I sit down in the chair, and he puts the gas on me and has to use a laser on my on the tooth that he just ground down to put the new crown on. So he's busy in the back on the uh, computer-generated tooth with the miniature lathe that he has there, making the tooth, discovers a little bit of the pulp was showing, and, um, well, after the Novocaine wore off, and the laser cauterization caught up with me, I was in a tremendous amount of pain. So I was walking around the house like this all night long, doing one of those Star Wars spooky guy things. The uh, Unabomber. I was the Unabomber last night. It was, um, it was, uh, pretty painful. Hold on one moment while I check with the show producer. Alrighty, I'm going to wait for the uh, show producer to get back to me. I'm sure that uh, most of you know by now. Guests are leaving on with the show, bro. Oh, okay. We had some problems with the stream there for a minute. At any rate, most of you have probably noticed that the internet is kind of slow tonight. Now, I'm going to show you why. This is a uh, real-time web monitor this is from the uh, Akamai I believe that's the name of it, the Akamai website right now as you can see right here where the mouse is the internet attacks are up 24% tonight 24% above normal you can see right here here in the United States, uh, Illinois is up, uh, has 43 attacks going, uh, 54 in Arkansas, 42 in Idaho, a bunch of them down there in uh, California. Now, if we go here, look at this, down here in South America and Brazil, 159 attacks. Peru's got 67 attacks. If we go over here to Taiwan, look at this. 218 network attacks just in the past 24 hours. China's getting a bunch of attacks. They're happening all over the world. So, <clears throat> that's uh, why the Internet is having problems tonight. There are a bunch of Internet attacks. Now, tonight's show is brought to us by SOS Online Backup. Now, you've heard all the stupid lines before and all the different radio and TV shows. Back up your computer before you lose everything. Well, sign up with SOS and do it. It's only like 10 bucks a month, and you'll sleep better at night. Click the link, the little banner below the show stream right there, and you'll go right to the SOS website, and you can sign up for online backup. These guys are pretty good. You know, I've been asking myself... What's this all about, this uh, thing that we do? Not the show, but the thing that we do during the day. It's called life. What I mean is, how do we reconcile our existence with reality? How can we justify our existence, our ability to choose, our ability to choose what government we want, and who exactly gets to choose it? Our government here in the United States was created by men and women who believed that we have rights given to us by our Creator, and that as such, we choose what rights we give to the government, not the other way around. That's the way it started. Sadly, due to an infiltration of demonic forces, we have lost that. To be clear, we have lost our freedoms, our rights, our ability to choose, and have become trapped in a society that assails us with a constant bombardment of both advice and and requirements. This is all attempts this this all attempts to supplicate us to the will of others. 
If you want entertainment, you must submit to the soft porn and what we have become, and what have become brainwashing techniques that were pioneered by a fellow by the name of Edward Bernays at the beginning of the 20th century. He's the one that started the big smoking craze. People didn't smoke cigarettes a lot until Edward Bernays came along and popularized it. It's all his fault. We have, by our own fault, given our rights to a government that has become so socialist and Marxist in nature that, well, we're just losing everything. This was done by the demonic infiltration into the, into the government that was set up to protect us. These demonic forces have now set out to subjugate us into submission. In the latest effort that is doomed to succeed, the Bill of Rights has been canceled. They just had the vote in the Senate the other day, 97 to 8. They've canceled the Bill of Rights. We have lost all of our rights by the very people that were supposedly elected to represent us. As such, and I'm going by the majority opinion here, we are no longer represented. The original motto, no taxation without representation, has become representation without consent. As citizens of the United Socialist States of America, it has apparently become time to up the ante, increase the load, apply the full force of Cloward and Piven to collapse the entire system and to allow us to become the controlled, the subjects of the empire, the serfs of the latest choice of the lesser of two evils. And now, it is time once again to choose our new supreme leader. As such, we citizens of the USSA will once again, I am sure, not make a wise choice, even if we bother to exercise the very last right that we have, the right to vote. And as such... I have concluded once again that we are indeed surrounded by idiots. suspicious activity to your local police or sheriff. You and I know and do not believe that life is so dear and peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery. A, a new world order. A new world order. A need for a new world order. We needed a new world order. <laughs> The decline of the dollar is actually a, a desire, a desire, a desirable. They say we offer simple answers to complex problems. Well, perhaps there is a simple answer. Not an easy answer, but simple. If you and I have the courage to tell our elected officials that we want our national policy based on what we know in our hearts is morally right, we cannot buy our security, our freedom from the... Hi there, I'm back. Our first story tonight is going to surprise a lot of people. SETI you, or SETI me, shall we do the SETI dance? That's right, the SETI dance. Red alert... Man the battle stations, engage the warp drive, everybody calm down. 
In the late 1950s, humans launched their first satellite, Sputnik. Everybody knows that, regardless of the brainwashing you received as a child. What you don't know is that there were articles written in publications, such as Time Magazine and Newsday, about an event that happened at that time and continued into man spaceflight and is more than likely happening right now. Let's take a look at the capture screen. Shall we? And here we are at the capture screen. I assume everybody can hear me okay. The uh, production staff will let me know if you cannot hear me. Hopefully you can. We're uh, using a couple of new microphone positions tonight. What you don't know is that about these articles, as Sputnik was orbiting the Earth, sending its beep, 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 it was followed. It was followed by an object that should not have existed at all. The object also interacted with American astronauts and was reported live on CBS News, sending its signals. Live. This device interacted with the Apollo astronauts as well. This device has interacted with humans directly. In one notable case, an author as well as reflecting radio signals from early broadcasts and broadcasting a signal that has been decoded. That's, this object is what is known as the Dark Knight. It is actually real. It exists and has been forgotten by most people. Now let's take a look at this. Now one of the things that I've done in the past and have done a lot of extensive testing on is something that I call the ATEC system, the After Times Emergency Communication System. It actually runs on the server that we use to stream this broadcast. And it uses a very small piece of software that acts as a web server, and you can serve up web pages. And this web page that I'm about to show you actually resides on that server. It's actually part of the ATEC system. The whole thing is designed so that if the internet goes down, <laughs> when they shut the internet off, people with a wireless router and the necessary equipment can start up their own home server and people in the neighborhood and in the city can communicate with each other. It's got a chat on it, it's got a message board on it, and it's got a series of web pages as well as documents, PDF files uh, about... Um, doing basic maintenance around the house, emergency dentistry, things like that. Let's take a look at this. This right here is what the web page looks like. It's a uh, server. You can sign up for an account and everything else. I don't run it much anymore because now we're doing the TV, the, uh, TV show here. This is called the Black Knight Satellite. Let me zoom in on this so you can see this a little bit better. There you go right there. The name of this article is the Black Knight Satellite. Now, I have been updating this article quite a bit. It is uh, a very interesting thing. It is said that in 1957, a blip of unknown origin was discovered as it was detected shadowing the Sputnik 1 craft as it was in a polar orbit. This object was dubbed the Black Knight. It was several times larger and several times heavier than anything capable of being launched with 1960s rockets. It shouldn't have been there, but it was. Now there's something else about that too, and that is this. At the time, the rockets that we had could not achieve a polar orbit. They could only achieve an equatorial orbit. We didn't have the rockets capable of doing that. This thing was in a polar orbit. The Pentagon 
Um, four years in 1953, four years before the USSR launched Sputnik 1, it was cited by Dr. Lincoln La Paz of the University of New Mexico. As more reports of sightings trickled in from around the world, the U.S. Department of Defense appointed distinguished astronomer Clyde W. Tombaugh to run a search for the mystery object. He's the guy that discovered Pluto. The Pentagon never formally released Dr. Tombaugh's study, and no more was heard about the object until 1957, when Dr. Luis Carrello's communications ministry in Venezuela, he was in Venezuela, we have some viewers that are down in South America that are, in fact, connected in the astronomy business. Maybe they can do a little search for me. The Communications Ministry in Venezuela, 1957, Dr. Luis Carolas. The first modern satellite, Sputnik 1, had been launched two months earlier. Dr. Caralas was taking pictures of Sputnik 1 as it passed over Caracas. Now here is a list, right underneath here, where you see the uh, little bullseye. These are the people that have investigated it. We've had um, Whispers from Space. We've had a book called Long Delayed Echoes, The Search for a Solution. Another book that's called Long Delayed Radio Echoes, Mechanisms and Observations, NASA Proposes a Journey to the Stars, and The Times, 28th of September, 1998, page 15, as well as Spaceship Moon, page 254. Now, I'm sure that uh, Dr. Corrales was taking pictures of Sputnik 2 as it passed over Caracas, and I'm sure that you would like to see what the Black Knight looks like. Well, I just happen to have some photographs of the Black Knight that this person took down in Venezuela. Now, you can see it right here. You can see there's Sputnik right there. Right there. Actually, my mistake, that's Sputnik right there. That's the Black Knight satellite following it right there. Let's go over here to another photo. There is the Black Knight satellite right there. There is Sputnik right there. This is a photograph of the actual thing right there. It actually existed. Now let's go over here. There we go. Here we go. An article. St. Louis Post-Dispatch. May 14th, 1954. Artificial satellites are circling the Earth. This is by Donald C. Kehoe. Maybe you remember him. The CIA Kehoe satellites are named after this guy. Who wrote a book about such things. You can hardly read this. I can uh, sort of read it here on the screen. You can see there was an article right here. The United States government scientists at White Sands, New Mexico, Kehoe said, are making an intensive effort to locate and chart the course of the satellites. Plural. Over here. Um, this is May 11th, 19, 19, May 14th, 1954, page 14, San Francisco Examiner. One or two artificial satellites circling the Earth. There you go, right there again. Donald E. Kehoe. And we'll go back here. Here is the photograph of the mystery satellite as it was following Sputnik right there. Now, let's go back to this article right here. You will note that we are attempting to corroborate this information. It's a uh, single point resource at this point. And I apologize about that. I have been looking for additional information for months now, and I can't find any. And uh, on 4 January 1962, objects of sizable proportions were detected in polar orbit. No country at that time was able to launch into polar orbit. These objects were estimated to weigh 15 tons each, compared with the largest satellite at that time, which only weighed 500 pounds, or the Soviet's 3,000-pound satellite. Official confirmation of the existence of something unexplained in Earth's orbit came in February of that year. 
February of 1960, officially confirmed by the United States government when the National Space Surveillance Control Center, the NSSCC, said that an unidentified satellite was in polar orbit. Further support for the belief that an alien probe may be in existence in our solar system appeared in the April 1995 volume of the Observatory, an astronomical journal published in the United Kingdom. The article's author, a one Duncan Steele of the University of Adelaide in Australia and an expert in the detection of small objects in near-Earth space. Here are the actual articles. Here, Hold on a second here. Let me uh, go over here. Open a new tab. Let me see if this comes up. Time Magazine, USA. <clears throat> oh, darn. To read it, you must be a subscriber. That's too bad. Well, I was able to get to it. Okay. March 7th, 1960, Time Magazine. Three weeks ago, headlines announced that the U.S. had detected a mysterious dark satellite wheeling overhead in a regular orbit. There was nervous speculation that it might be a surveillance satellite launched by the Russians. It brought the uneasy sensation that the U.S. did not know what was going on over our own head. But last week, the Department of Defense proudly announced that the satellite had been identified. It was a space derelict. Isn't that something? They started lying right along in 1960. Here's a, uh, another article. September 1st, 1960, by a one Bob Caro. It is not a satellite, and it's not a meteor. Any astronomer can tell you that. And he can tell you its color, and to some extent, its speed. It's just one thing he can't tell you what it is. He can't even guess. That's the status at the moment of the week-long nationwide attempt to identify the mysterious reddish object that has been circling the Earth since last Thursday. Frank Judson of Chicago's famed Adler Planetarium says, I've been watching it for days. I don't have the faintest idea what it is. The Grumman Aircraft Engineering Corporation announced yesterday that a tracking camera at the Bethpage plant in New York had photographed the object at 8.51 p.m. on Thursday. That would have been August 31st. The white line, difficult to detect, was barely visible even after the photo was enlarged. Expert observers just plain and just plain citizens have been catching glimpses of the mysterious object over in Long Island, Chicago, Washington, Boston, New York, and points west. But the few conclusions that, are, that we, they are able to draw about its behavior only heightens the mystery of what it is. Um, and now we come to the really, really cool part of this. And this is where the uh, astronomers in our audience, and this uh, show is being recorded, so the astronomers can watch this on our YouTube channel afterwards. This is where the astronomers in our audience will come in handy, not only for doing some research on the background of this thing, because apparently it did exist, but what I'm going to show you next... Hold on to your hats. One has to wonder if the following supposed deciphering of the message from the Black Knight, that's right, it actually broadcast a message. How the thing knew to call its home star Epsilon Bootis. We'll learn about that in a later update. Suffice to say, the computer system that makes up the Black Knight is sophisticated enough to learn. This is the message deciphered in the 1970s from the Black Knight satellite. Here we go, right here. Um, let me see if I can zoom in on that a little bit more. Start here. Our home is Epsilon Bootis which is a double star. We live on the sixth planet of seven. Check that, six of seven. Counting outwards from the sun, which is the larger of the two? Our sixth planet has one moon. Our fourth planet has three. Our first and third planets have one. each have one. Our probe is in the orbit of your moon. This updates the position of the Arcturus shown on our maps. The Black Knight mystery satellite 
first discovered by the United States using the Black Fence Radar System, which was the precursor to NORAD. A tracking camera at the Grumman Aircraft Corporation's Long Island factory took a photograph of it. People on the ground have been occasionally seeing it for about two weeks at that point, which was in 1960. Gordon Cooper, now listen to this. Gordon Cooper was launched into space for a 22-orbit mission. On his final orbit, he reported seeing a glowing green shape ahead of his capsule heading in his direction. This event was reported on NBC. On May 16, 1963, this is part of the same thing, astronaut Gordon, Gordon Cooper was talking to Mission Control on a special frequency channel when extra alien voices broke in. Later examined on tape, these voices were found to correspond with known, known language. On the Apollo 8 Bowman Level Anders mission on December 21st, when UFOs were seen in the lunar orbit, more voices broke into the communications channel with mission control. Now, this report about Gordon Cooper that was reported. I earlier said CBS. I stand corrected. It was NBC. When they tried to ask him, this was reported live on the air, okay? The transmissions were going out, and the voice came over the air live, free and clear. They asked Gordon Cooper about that afterwards, and NASA said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. It was simply carbon dioxide poisoning, and poor old Gordon Cooper, he was hallucinating. So you didn't really hear those voices. That was part of Gordon Cooper's hallucination. That's how that went. So let's go back to the screen here. The Black Knight apparently has been in place for a thousand years. The Black Knight reflected back radio broadcasts. That's why a lot of radio broadcasts, that first, uh, the first radio broadcast, that's why a lot of those were had like an echo to them, because it, they were being bounced back from this thing. In uh, early, as early as 1928, uh, let's see, Edenhoven Holland, and again in 1929 aboard a French research vessel in the South China Sea, after transmitting over the radio waves, three sounds in rapid succession every 30 seconds, Van der Poel in Endhoven examined the return echoes. They were not as neatly spaced as he had sent. In fact, they were highly irregular, ranging from 1 to 30 seconds in delay time. That was from the Black Knight. Apparently, Arthur C. Clarke's book, Rendezvous with Rama, is based on the Black Knight. The Black Knight, according to author, science fiction author, Philip K. Dick, apparently, he says he was in communication, personal communication, with the Dark Knight satellite. Which I find highly, highly interesting. So, SETI me or SETI you, shall we do the SETI dance? So let's take a look at something else along these lines. Wait, there's more! <laughs> oh, I got so much for you guys tonight, it's unbelievable. So let's go back over here to our show notes. Um, now there's supposed to be another link right here. Where is it? Uh, let's reload this page and see if this stuff shows up. Ah, there we go. We have a another one here. Let's get rid of that. We're going to get rid of that article. And we are going to get rid of that photograph right there. Okay, before it's news. Don't laugh. Before it's news has some good information on it. Okay, let's see if we can get this thing to scroll. Here we go right here. The NSA releases ultra-secret file regarding an effort to decode decades-old alien signals. And you see right there, look, there's a picture of an alien right there. 
It's got to be about aliens. Scientists determined that mysterious signals received in 1957 were transmitted to Earth from an advanced alien civilization. So, let's review. The signals of 1957 came from the mysterious red object in a polar orbit as reported by, reported by Newsday, Time Magazine, Northrop Grumman, uh, this Tombaugh guy, and a couple of other people, including the uh, astronomer, Mr. Kehoe. And now, the NSA is telling us, whoa, 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 wait a minute, no such thing. It's actually coming from us, ancient civilization out in space. So, now, they're muddying up the waters once again. So, let's go back and humor ourselves with this stupid NSA article. Because, you see, I started collecting this information about this thing years ago. I've known about this for years. So, I've had this information Hard copy in my hands. You can see I've got copies of the photographs, I've got copies of the articles, and I've got copies of all the information. Most of it's still out there on the Internet. It's been propagating for years. Do a search for it. The Dark Knight, or the Black Knight, if you will. Not the Batman movie, but the satellite. Mysterious alien satellite. Let's go back over here to the capture and humor ourselves. In 2011, the National Security Agency, one of the United States' most secret intelligence-gathering organizations, has released under protest, forced by an order of the U.S. federal court judge, stunning information about intelligent life in the universe. But, as usual, the non-curious, inept, doltish, mainstream media completely ignores it. Oh, of course they're going to ignore it until the damn thing lands in front of the White House. And you can see right there, look at it, there's a guy sitting, standing right there. He's wearing a suit and everything. He's wearing a military suit. So you know this is a real article. NSA and analysts marvel at strange messages. messages. 29 lengthy transmissions were received and verified of being of extraterrestrial origin, according to some in the intelligence community. This hot potato was given the highest priority and assigned to Google goggle-eyed geeks tasked to finding out exactly what the enigmatic transmissions said. Well, we know what the transmissions said. The damn thing said it's from Epsilon Buddhist. Come on. Speculation among some of the NSA spooks about what the mysterious signals said allegedly ran the gamut from sarcastic guesses that there were just some garbled alien radio commercials and inside droke that drew nervous laughter from some of the analysts to those that were convinced the messages coded in some unknown mathematical progression conveyed the basics of unlimited energy, star travel, and even time travel. So, what we're saying here is that uh, they got a bunch of hocus pocus going on to uh, try to, like, soften us up for something. What they're trying to soften us up for, I got no idea. But I know this Dark Knight satellite existed. Broke it on radio communications. It was broadcast live on NBC, Apollo 8. Got messages from this thing. A science fiction author said that he was in communication with it, and there were plenty of articles back when it was first discovered. Apparently, it has left orbit, and it is now, supposedly, in one of the trailing Trojan points of the moon. We'll see. So let's go on to our next article. That was a pretty good opening story, wasn't it? I think so. I figure there's probably some black helicopters over the house right now. Whatever. Ron Paul kill order? Ah, how about that one? Okay, so this is pretty far out there even for me to believe. And at this point, I believe just about anything. As I'm sure you know... Even if you're halfway following conspiracy websites or even mainstream websites, the opinion out there is that the president can issue a kill order on citizens via some spooky committee. 
This is probably one of those fake news stories that we see floating around on the web these days, but who the heck knows at this point that, uh, what's it, that, that Sasha Fall or whatever it is, that guy that's uh, some half-witted writer out in Minnesota or something that masquerades as some uh, spooky Russian intelligence gatherer or something. You've seen the stories all over it. Okay. The Federal, the federal Security Service, FSB, I knew it. It's one of those fake stories. I didn't read this copy before. Yeah, it's one of those fake stories. Okay, never mind. Uh, He's reporting today that the uh, secret letter sent to Prime Minister Putin by Japanese Prime Minister Yashikamoto Noda contains a warning that the United States President Barack Obama has <laughs> ordered an executive-level kill order against the United States Congressman Ron Paul over fears that he's going to become the Republican candidate. Like, that's ever going to happen. Come on. Never mind. Forget about that story. Just forget it. Move on. We don't need bad guys anymore. We've got Draco. Draco, of course, stands for Democratic Restriction Administration of Companies and Organizations, also known as Draco. That, of course, is my copyrighted anacronym, Draco. The Democratic Restriction Administration of Companies and Organizations. Well, the draconian EPA rules in order to kill the coal industry, and that is leading to rolling blackouts in Texas. This comes to us from Alex Jones, Infowars.com. I'll show you the website in just a minute. One has to wonder how the Mexicans will feel about this since we supply some of their power, too. But let me guess, the Ronin blackouts won't affect them. After all, we have to bring ourselves down to third world status just to make everybody equal. Remember the axiom that we Christian conservatives came up with after the 2008 election, which of course led to the 2010 Tea Party route, which hasn't done a damn bit of good? It's the redistribution model of the New World Order. If you have $2 and someone else has $1, you have to give them one of yours to them. After all, it's their turn. This is what the Occupy movement is all about. They deserve it. It's their turn now. You've had your turn. It's their turn. Give up your stuff. It's part of the Occupy theology. Just wait until it's someone else's turn to have your house. And then... Are you going to stay a sheeple? I wonder. Let's take a look at the article. Just so we can uh, give uh, Alex Jones a little bit of free publicity, because it can never hurt. There's the uh, Ron Paul kill order, the FSB fake news story. The EPA kills people. Here we go. This is uh, yourprisonplanet.com. Alex Jones. There's a picture of Mr. Jones right there looking uh, like all pissed off and stuff. Uh, this is by uh, Paul Joseph Watson, PrisonPlanet.com. He, of course, is taking credit for the whole thing. Oh, let me see here. Um, what do we got here? We got uh, 10 months down the line. Lo- okay. In re- okay, here we go. Well, let me read this article to you because um, this goes more into it than what I wrote. When rolling blackouts hit Texas at the start of the year, we wrote a series of articles pointing out that President Barack Hussein Obama's promise to bankrupt the coal industry in the form of draconian EPA regulations that would cause older power plants to close had contributed to the power outages. Several of these articles were picked up by the likes of the Drudge Report and Fox News, stoking a wider controversy. This was written on December 2, 2011. In response, the White House Communications Director, Ron Dan Pfeffer, claimed in a blog post that appeared on WhiteHouse.gov that the story came from a questionable source and was of unquestionably false. We then issued a rebuttal documenting how blackouts were causing were being caused by a maxed-out power grid and not by mechanical failures, as Pfeffer claimed in his article. 
Ten months down the line, in the Austin American Statesman reports today that Texas could face power shortages as soon as next year as aging plants are mothballed in response to new environmental standards, according to the state's grid operator and organization that monitors the U.S. power grids for the federal government. In other words, ourselves, that would be Prison Planet and Dr. or Mr. Joseph Watson, Paul Joseph Watson. Um, let me see here. In other words, ourselves and other critics who want the EPA's draconian eco regulations would cause rolling blackouts after being attacked by the White House have been proven to be completely accurate. And there you go. Welcome to the USSA. Similar to the USSR, except for one letter. And here we go. Here's my next story. Obama is between a Nazi and a broken arm. How's that for a title for a news story? Sounds spooky, right? Well, Obama now has to choose between the Enviro Nazis and the arm busting unions. See, we were going to get all of these great oil sands from Canada. Sand oil. You see them on the ice road truckers. When they're delivering their, uh, their stuff... To these mining places, those are the the wells that are getting the oil sands up from the ground. There's a lot of oil up there, as much as in the as in the Middle East, up in Canada, and they want to build a pipeline to ship it down here in the United States because Canada wants to sell us the oil. We were going to get those Canadian oil sands until Obama realized that the Obama nation, third world status, has to have hyperinflation, no energy, and destitute citizens. So he delayed the decision on the new oil pipeline called the Keystone XL project. This made the Enviro Nazis so happy, but the labor unions that fill the Democratic coffers ain't none too pleased about the decision. See, they like to run their equipment and have jobs. It's one of the problems when you're running a country like the USSA. When the Obama administration postponed a decision on the massive oil pipeline project, it pleased the Enviro Nazis, but angered the labor unions, whose representatives told a congressional committee Friday that the Keystone XL project isn't just a pipeline, it's a lifeline for workers. We believe that the benefits of this pipeline are too many to allow it to be derailed by environmental extremists. The Keystone XL will create good-paying jobs here in the U.S. and Canada, says Brent Booker of the Labor Laborers International Union. And Bruce Burton of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, adds the Keystone XL pipeline is shovel-ready. As soon as a presidential permit is granted, jobs will be created. 20,000 jobs just to start the project. This thing could have almost a quarter of a million jobs that come with it. By the time you build this pipeline, from the oil sands down to the refineries and having to build the new refineries to refine this crude, we'd be sitting happy, we'd have plentiful gasoline, we wouldn't have to rely on the Middle East oil, everybody around the world would be a lot happier, but Obama has decided to delay the building of the XL pipeline, and as such, the Canadians have to sell their oil to somebody. Guess who? I'll give you three guesses. Let's take a look at the... Uh... Oh, but wait, there's more. There's another story here that goes along with this. Let me show this to you. Um, okay, here we go. Uh, here's your uh, pipeline link right here about the uh, XL. This is uh, the Fox News website. See, Obama administration is pressured by the GOP and unions to expedite the controversial pipeline project. So what we're saying here is at this point, a decision has to be made. Who is going to get you more votes to get reelected? 
the unions or the environmentalists? The unions or the environmentalists? That's a tough choice. I wouldn't want to make that choice myself. I wouldn't want to make that choice. But now if we go over here, we have a related story. Um, dee -dee 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 -dee. Here we go. North of the Arctic Circle, the tiny village of uh, Nukasut, Alaska, has become the latest flashpoint in the struggle between oil drilling and environmentalism. The town with a population of 400, nearly all Eskimos, sits on the edge of the Colville River and the National Petroleum Reserve, or NPR. How isolated is it? It takes four flights and eight hours to get there from Seattle. Conical Phillips wants to build a road bridge and pipeline over the river to connect to the nearby Alpine development, which sits just outside the NPR. But the Army Corps of Engineers has rejected the plan, telling the oil company it had to go under the river. The Interior Department Secretary, Ken Salazar, supports the Corps' decision. It has to be done right away. It has to be done in the right way, in the right place, and making sure we're taking into account environmental protections. But here's the grand plan, you see. Conical Phillips said piping below the river is too expensive and risky. In its application, the company argued the oil coming out of the NPR would be a mix of oil, gas, and water, which poses a greater threat of corrosion. If the pipes are underground, they're harder to monitor if a problem arises. And here is the actual article. And I believe this is uh, also at Fox News. Although there will be other articles on the Internet, they just happen to have a video that I watched. That's why I use them as the source. So there is your stuff right there. And as we know, these guys are really into doing things kind of sneaky. And the more of this, the sneakiness is sort of exposed, if you will, the more we know about it. So they tell Conical Phillips, you got to put this thing under the ground. Conical Phillips says, look, this thing's going to be filled with oil, gas, and water. It's going to corrode. And, of course, the EPA and the Corps of Engineers and the Interior Department, they'll say, no, 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 put it under, under the river. It'll be fine. Everything will be fine. And then when the thing corrodes and starts leaking in a few years, it's going to be another big oil emergency, except in this time it's not going to be BP, it's going to be Conical Phillips, and we have to start banning oil drilling up in Alaska. So that's how that's going to go. I believe that was their plan all along, which has now, unfortunately for them, been exposed. So let me see here. We have the... Um, last story of the evening and I've been on the air for an hour I'm quite proud of myself oh wait oh I've got two stories hold on a minute I got one that's kind of a fun story um, this comes to us from the Huffington Post a homeowner chased down and hogtied a man suspected of burglarizing his home twice in one day near Athens Ohio a sheriff says normally I wouldn't do an article like this, however, however, there is a side note to it. William Stanley's video game systems had already been stolen on Thursday when he returned home in the evening to find an intruder inside. TV station WBNS reports Stanley became the victim who fought back and won. He recognized a crook from the neighborhood and chased him through the woods. The unnamed thief eluded Stanley, but only temporarily. Stanley went to the villain's home, fought him, tied him up with a belt, took him back to his house, and called the cops. Sheriff Pat Kelly said the thief had been hogtied, according to the Associated Press. He added that the out-muscled burglar was unconscious when the cops showed up, but believes that was because the captured man was under the influence. Sort of like me. The thief's identity won't be revealed until he's indicted. Although Stanley's tactics bordered on vigilantism, the sheriff says the homeowner broke no laws. However, Kelly cautioned other civilians against going after criminals in a similar fashion. So what you're supposed to do 
You're supposed to call the cop. Even if you catch the guy in the house and know where he lives, you're supposed to call the cops, they'll take a report, and they'll never catch the guy and he won't get your stuff back. That's how it's supposed to work. Come on. You know, take your stuff and let somebody else have it. Give me a break. Here's your unemployment doom on story, and it is, in fact, our final story of the night because my voice is getting kind of hoarse at this point because I'm just not used to talking out loud. Usually, the voices in my head have all the conversations, and I just don't talk at all. I just have the conversations in my head. But, sadly, I have to talk to you. Oh, I don't mind talking to you because I am, after all, a broadcast professional. Here's the thing about the unemployment figures. I'm sure you've heard. The unemployment rate has dropped down to 8.6%. And everybody is dancing. Let's get some... uh, I'm sure we've got some dancing music here on the um, old computer somewhere. Let's see if we can find um, a dancing song. There we go. There's a dancing song right there. Unemployment's down to 8.6%. It's dance. Okay, that's enough of that. That was your dancing. Here's the thing. The joy all around the USSA and the abomination is thrilling. The unemployment rate is down to 8.6%. Oh, the joy. That's because no Supreme Leader has been re-elected when unemployment has been above 9%. And now we've got 8.6%. The re-election is in the bag. And thus, now we have our 8.6%. And everybody is rejoicing. But wait a minute. Let's look at these figures. You see, in order for this magical event to take place, there has to be a certain massaging of the information. Like a massage front for a cat house, the official propaganda arm of the nation has come up with a thrilling and exciting new way of obtaining the unemployment figures. You're going to love this. Here's how. You see, the new unemployment claims went up 420,000 last week. And 120,000 new jobs popped into existence. So how do you drop the unemployment rate a full one-half percent with those figures? How is that possible? It's easy, as it turns out. Here's what you do. You take the number of people that have given up looking for work this past period of time, which is 315,000. You add to it the 120,000 people that have found jobs. And, wait for it, you now have 435,000 people that aren't unemployed anymore. Because the ones that stop looking for work, the government doesn't consider them as unemployed. They cease to exist. Well, hell, if you're one of the 315,000 people, you don't exist, according to the government of the USSA. So there you go. Bing, bang, boom. You lower the unemployment rate a full half percent, and now we can re-elect the dear leader without having to resort to that always popular campaigning deal. Now we know he's going to get re-elected because we're on the road to recovery. 435,000 people aren't unemployed anymore. But only 120,000 found jobs. And I've got a couple other stories, but um, guess what? I've been on the air for an hour and my dinner is ready. So I'm going to close out the show. <clears throat> I'm going to say, please, please, visit our show's sponsor, SOS backup services click the banner right below the video that you're watching if you're watching live if not go to our show page at suddenskymysteries.com slash social and go to the show page and click the banner because we like to make a profit and they're one of our advertisers so until Monday night because I'm not going to do a show tomorrow night and the next show is going to be Monday night. My name is Bill Zam, and I'd like to say thank you for showing up. And I'm going to take my act elsewhere. (laughs) 
I love this look. I'm going to go walking around town tomorrow. We go downtown. We're supposed to have a holiday parade. In fact, that's supposed to be tonight. I might go downtown walking around like this and see if anybody notices. People will be going, hey, look, there's Bill Zab. I recognize him from that show last night. I'll see you guys tomorrow night. Have a good evening. Good night. I'm going to replay the uh, the uh, Boris um, Arda Minko interviews again, and I may replay the uh, Cliff High interview tomorrow. Have a good evening. Thanks for showing up, and we'll see you later.